Hello. Thank you so much, Hannah. And it's a huge pleasure to be here. Thanks to Intelligence Squared. All the team there, I think, have worked very hard to bring this event uh, together. And it's a particular pleasure to be able to do that because we have uh, an old friend of Intelligence Squared, and I hope to say an old friend of mine, in the chair today. It is, of course, Professor Neil Ferguson, who is one of the best known historians working in the world, really, today. He is currently a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, although, as I think we may gather in the conversation, he has uh, been uh, more locationally varied during the course of the, the last year. He's also a senior faculty fellow at the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. And he's the author of 16 books and counting, one must say. They include classics such as The Pity of War, The House of Rothschild, Empire, Civilization, and the first part of a definitive biography of Henry Kissinger, the first half called The Idealist, and we're very much looking forward, I think, to, to part two. Recently, he also published The Square and The Tower. He writes a column for Bloomberg Opinion, and he's the founder and managing director of the advisory firm Greenmantle LLC. And the most recent of that long run of books is the one that Hannah just mentioned, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. And I'm looking forward very much to talking about that with Neil and also with all of you who have joined us tonight for this event. We're going to have an hour together for the first half an hour or so. Neil and I will be in conversation. And then in the second half, we will be taking your questions. And you don't have to wait till the half hour is over to start asking them. Please use the question function, which you can find on the uh, bottom of your screen, the ask question button. Just click it, pop in your question. If you'd like to put in your name and where you're located, please do that. If you'd rather ask anonymously, that's absolutely fine as well. Uh, but please make sure whatever you do, you press the send button. Otherwise, we will not receive your question and won't be able to put it to our speaker today. So I hope that that is all clear. And also, if you are a tweeter, please make sure that at um, all times you are uh, tweeting hashtag IQ2 as well. That will be fantastic if you were to join us in that way also. So I think high time we got to the uncompromisingly uh, termed doom and find out what exactly the politics of catastrophe are. Um, Neil, um, it's a great pleasure to be uh, with you this evening. Um, I have to say you've got a fantastically sort of undoom-like setting behind you there. You look like you're in rather nice circumstances at the moment. I, I hope that accurate, accurately reflects where you are at the moment. Well, thank you, Rana. It's a pleasure to join you and everybody at Intelligence Squared. Uh, I am in California, and California gives the impression uh, of being paradise. Uh, except that it bursts into flames annually uh, and each year on a larger scale and on a wider extent. So uh, while it may look like uh, paradise, and I'm sure if it's still hailing in Oxford, it does, uh, in reality, uh, I'm in a very combustible uh, neck of the woods. I'm also a very short distance away from one of the great fault lines, that San Andreas Fault. And at some point, there'll be an absolutely huge earthquake here. Uh, I hope not during this broadcast. Uh, so there are lots of ways in which disaster looms, even when things look absolutely idyllic, as that I admit they do behind me. Well, let's say not so much paradise lost as par paradise possibly imploding, but we very much hope that we'll hold off from that in the next uh, hour or so. Um, the book is about COVID amongst other things. And it's of course not a coincidence that it's uh, come out during the middle of this current pandemic. And we will of course talk about that, but it's about much more than that as well. The bigger question of why some societies and some types of political systems respond better than others to catastrophe. And without having you spill the beans at the beginning, I am going to ask you to spill the beans a little bit at this point. What's the overall thesis of the book? What is the answer to the question about what kind of societies do respond better to catastrophes of all sorts? Well, the thesis is that uh, disasters, whether they're natural or man-made, are all to some extent uh, politically mediated. It's a, a function of politics, uh, how great the excess mortality gets to be when a novel pathogen suddenly sweeps the world. Uh, and so that's part one of my answer. That's, that's why the subtitle is, is important. E even the things that we think of as completely natural, uh, like a pandemic, uh, in fact, re re require politics to become disastrous because COVID wasn't disastrous everywhere. And the same applies when you look at all 
of the great disasters in history, including, including wars. Uh, and, and wars can inflict devastating casualties uh, on a country and the country can hold together or relatively mild uh, impacts can somehow lead to collapse. There's no straightforward correlation, in other words, between the body count and the resilience of a society. And what interests me is that there are clearly in history some societies that are remarkably resilient, uh, can cope with the uh, successive disasters of, of multiple forms and still carry on functioning. And this seems to be partly to do with state competence, state structure, and how the institutions of the state function uh, in the face of disaster. But it's also to do with social cohesion, I think, and how far a, a society hangs together when there's an enormous stress test going on. So that, that's broadly speaking the, the overall argument. Uh, I haven't told you the answer. Uh, I think the answer is that societies need to be and institutions need to be quite nimble. It's, it's flexibility of response that seems to me to be the key and often speed of response. Uh, and, and societies that look on paper to be tremendously well prepared uh, for disaster with 36 page reports of pandemic preparedness can turn out not to be because they've got an excessively rigid approach to crisis management. And, and that, that I think is the, the answer to the question. That it is much better to be uh, a resilient, nimble, rapid responder, uh, rather than to be kind of over-prepped bureaucracy when, when disaster strikes. Just to follow up on that thought, um, Neil, one word that you left out of that um, string of adjectives was democratic. And reading, having read the book, it doesn't seem to me that you necessarily feel that the argument is about democratic systems versus authoritarian ones in terms of dealing with the most recent pandemic. So is that, is that not a factor particularly? I, I don't think it is. I mean, a lot of, of the kind of naive commentary last year uh, said, oh, look how badly the democracies are handling this and look how well China has handled it with its uh, draconian lockdown. And I thought that was a complete misreading of what was happening. A, the disaster had begun in the Chinese system because rather af as after Chernobyl, there had been lies and uh, uh, and deceptions and delays, which caused the, the crisis to get much, much worse. Uh, but also the draconian lockdown that China imposed on itself in late January wasn't the optimal solution. The optimal so solution was what Taiwan did, a democracy, uh, and what South Korea did, a democracy. The, those were the countries that rapidly tested large numbers of people and used contact tracing to figure out who might have been infected and then quarantined or isolated the people who were. Uh, so that the best performances came from democracies and the worst performances came from democracies. Uh, a lot of naive generalizations also followed the form, populist leaders are to blame for disastrous excess mortality. Well, in, in some countries, they certainly didn't help matters, but there were plenty of countries that had non-populist leaders that did even worse. Belgium did terribly well, terribly badly last year, uh, and its prime minister for most of the year was a, a liberal woman, Sophie Wilmers. Peru has had about the worst excess mortality, and it's not a populist who was running uh, Peru last year. So I, I kind of came to realize as I picked my way through some of the commentary last year, how tempting it is to jump to conclusions about which political system is doing best. It's a lot more complicated than that. And, and you've raised in my mind a really important point that the book delves into. And that's Amartya Sen's argument about famines. Mm. And I'm sure you're going to ask me about that because it's, it's right up your street as a historian of, of China. Uh, Amartya Sen's path-breaking work on, on famine argued that ultimately one shouldn't think of a famine as a natural disaster that it was essentially a political failure. And in one essay, he argued that a democracy, he had India in mind, would, would never have uh, tolerated the kind of famines that Mao's China suffered, largely as a consequence of the crazy policies that, that Mao pursued uh, in, in the 1950s. And I, I was tremendously impressed by that argument when I first encountered it. But when I was writing Doom, I find myself saying, well, if, if that's true of famines, is it Shouldn't it be true of all disasters? And then I began to realize that it might not actually be true of all disasters. And it doesn't seem to have been true of this one, of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic.
Well, you're quite right, Neil, that we will come back to some of those questions of how you know, the world outside the West and indeed China have dealt with the, these questions. So we'll, we'll put a pause on that, but, but one that we will certainly come back to. Before we do that, though, I want to dive into some of the historical examples that you give in the book. And just because most commentary which looks at the history has been looking at the 1918-19 flu pandemic, and that, yeah, that is very, very important, I want to choose one of the other pandemics that you look at. And it's one that's known, but not as well remembered. The so-called Asian flu, in those days, you're still allowed to give geographical locations to, uh, to diseases. Uh, the Asian flu of 1957. And you look at it from the point of view of the administration then of President Eisenhower, uh, you know, the post-war era in the United States, when we think of actually as a time of prosperity, one when America was beginning to rise, or had risen to the global power in the Cold War. But looked at through the lens of that particular disease, you tell a somewhat different story. Yes, I, I got very interested in 1957-58 precisely because I hadn't known about it before and indeed no one had ever mentioned it to me until last year when my good friend Nicholas Christakis, one of the world's leading authorities uh, on pandemics and network science, uh, mentioned it, uh, I think in a tweet, and my ears, as it were, pricked up. In 57-58, the world was hit by a pandemic, a, a new strain of influenza, uh, comparable in scale to COVID-19, much more like it than 1918-19, the so-called Spanish influenza, which was a devastating disaster, killed about 39 million people. If, if, if something like that happened it, with our global population, you would be looking at a, a death toll in the hundreds of millions. Uh, but 1957-58 uh, killed about the same proportion of the world's population as COVID has so far which is around about 0.04%. Uh, it, it's not the same disaster. It wasn't as big a disaster in the United States as, as COVID has been. But globally, it seems about in the right ballpark. And also, interestingly, unlike COVID, uh, the, uh, the Asian flu of 57, 58 killed a lot of young people uh, and affected the very young as much as the very old. And it also affected and caused a great deal of, of illness and mortality amongst teenagers. So if you do the calculation on life years lost, considering that 80% of the Americans who died of COVID have been over 65, actually about roughly the same number of life years were lost, maybe a bit less, in 57, 58. So what's interesting about this? What is interesting is the completely different reaction of the Eisenhower administration and American society at large to this disaster. Uh, there is no lockdown. Uh, schools are not closed. Uh, there isn't even a state of emergency. The public health officials know that the virus is going to sweep through the country and, and cause excess mortality, but they, they tell the president that we can't really stop this. Uh, and so we're just going to focus all our efforts on finding a vaccine. And remarkably, because we've been telling ourselves that what happened last year was a uh, a feat of medical science without precedent. Well, unfortunately, that's not true. There was a precedent. Morris Hillman found a, vi a vaccine against the Spanish flu in just a matter of months, and, and not only found it, but the US government was able to deploy it even faster than we've deployed the COVID, COVID vaccines. So it's a remarkable story, more, I think, for the very different way in which uh, government and society reacted in, in 2020 as compared with the way they reacted in 1957. Well, one of the other things that I think was fascinating to me about the story, and I knew you know, very little about the, the events uh, as well, so it was, it was a real eye-opener, was the way in which, as you point out, attitudes towards risk were also rather different at that point. One of the things, and in many ways quite rightly, that has happened during the most recent pandemic is that there has been a pretty strong precautionary principle, certainly amongst developed countries in uh, Europe, in North America, and those sorts of, uh, of, of areas. You could argue, actually, the same about China, I suppose, on the grounds that massive, brutal crackdowns are precautionary, if, if, if nothing else. Whereas the impression I get from you know what you say about the, that 1950s period is that it's an era when polio is still, you know, running pretty rampant uh, amongst the, 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 the youth of that country. We had a president just a decade before, President Roosevelt, who had uh, suffered polio in his, his youth. At the same time, of course, this is still a generation just a year out of the most devastating global war. And overall, do you think, I mean, in, in a way that's become rather politically incorrect for, for, for understandable reasons, perhaps in our most recent pandemic, a lot of people were there simply saying, well, you know, a lot of people will get this, a lot of people will die, and that's just the way that the world works. I think it's clear from talking to 
to people who lived through it that that was the mentality then. Uh, people actually worried more about polio in the 50s than they worried about influenza, though they probably should have worried more about influenza in terms of its, uh, its overall mortality. Uh, that they had been through not only World War II, but the Korean War. Uh, there was a sense that life uh, was bound to deal you uh, some bad hands. And uh, th th this was just something you had to take in your stride. And since I first started writing about this, I published a paper about it last year when I first was working on it. I've had lots of response from people who lived through it, including a friend who said, I actually had the biggest, worst illness of my life at the age of 10. Uh, during that uh, pandemic. And he said, and you know, what, what strikes me looking back is is how we just got on with life. And I've heard that from many, many Americans who, who recollect the pandemic, uh, but but recollect also the, the way in, in which people were stoical about it. And clearly that wasn't what happened uh, in, in 2020. In 2020, there was an extraordinary polarization along political lines in, in a way that's completely unrecognizable because in the 1950s, a public health crisis was a public health crisis. You didn't politicize it. Nobody attempted to do that. In 2020, every issue uh, from the virus itself to mask wearing to vaccination became politicized. Uh, and, and Democrats, broadly speaking, were extremely risk averse, uh, exaggerated the, the risk that they f faced personally, uh, and Republicans were completely the opposite and understated the risk uh, that they faced. So that's how one of the ways, at least, in which in, in which the United States ha has changed. By the way, uh, as this is likely a mostly British audience, uh, 57, 58 was not especially bad, although it did uh, affect the United Kingdom. 1951 was much worse. Uh, and the 1951 influenza uh, really shows up if you look at the uh, long run US, uh, UK mortality data. Uh, it, it, it's actually one of the worst years in the past century or so uh, for high mortality, along with 1918, uh, 1940, and, and 2020. And almost nobody remembers the 1951 influenza uh, pandemic unless you're kind of elderly Liverpudlian because Liverpool had an especially torrid time of it in that year. And it's a reminder that quite often things which are utterly devastating at the time can sometimes really fade from memory quite quickly in certain ways, although they turn up in slightly different sorts of ways. I mean, one of the notes that I really liked about the 1919 uh, pandemic that uh, you, you talked about was the fact that it had affected the culture of the 1920s. And I'm thinking here particularly of a jazz song I was not previously aware of by Huey Smith called Rockin' Pneumonia and the Boogie Woogie Flu. Uh, I must say that's not kind of on my list of, of, of Kurt Vile classics, but maybe you've been spinning it uh, in your uh, pandemic hideaway there, Real. Well, actually, Rana, the Rockin' Pneumonia and the Boogie Woogie Flu was a 1957 hit. Uh, oh, sorry, yes, uh, well, it's the time. Uh, it, right. it, it's... Uh, uh, it, it's actually, and it's a rather a good number. It made, made, made the charts, though not quite up there with El Elvis's uh, Teddy Bear, which was one of the big hits of, of that year. Uh, but, but I think the interesting thing about the song is that it makes light of a disease that was very threatening to teenagers. Now, now one of the points about this is that teenagers were the most gregarious people uh, in America in the 1950s, and they were probably the most gregarious people in, in the world because this was the age of, uh, of, of just teenage heaven, nonstop uh, parties, uh, camps. It seems to me that being a teenager in 1950s America was probably more fun than being human had ever been before. Certainly looking at the movies from that time, you get the impression that that was so. And yet they were all running tremendous risk by being so convivial in 1957, 58. And yet uh, the Boogie Woogie Blues, uh, or sorry, the Boogie Woogie Flu is probably an exception on the grounds that most teenagers, if they were imbibing popular culture, would be more worried about being smashed up in an automobile accident like James Dean. They were less worried, presumably, about sniffling themselves to uh, to an early grave. In, uh, yeah, the I mean, that, people made light of it. And that's that's something that, that there hasn't been nearly as much of in the, in the last year, where even the British sense of humour has seemed to falter uh, in the face of, of excess mortality. And that probably has something to do with the fact that people are still very close to, in this country, over 100,000 deaths, and it will take time to come past that. We're going to carry on our discussion, but just a reminder to our audience, please do join in as well. Do send in those questions. Do tweet on hashtag IQ2. We're very keen to get your questions for Neil uh, about not just COVID, but also the wider question of the politics of catastrophe. And let me move on, if I may, to 
take up some of the wider ideas that you put forward in the book, um, Neil, some of which I think drawn on previous work that you've done, which talk about how we learn from history or don't. Because you do use the phrase failure to learn for history as one of several points that you make about what we should try and put forward. But, you know, we all know that history is not a simple textbook from which you can simply uh, draw. That's political science. No, not really, he says, uh, apologising <laughs> to any political scientists in the audience. Um, but what does it mean in practice to learn from history, whether it's this particular catastrophe or maybe maybe another one? How would you do it in practice? <sighs> Well, I've been beating the drum for applied history for some years now in the belief that certainly in the United States, far too little regard is paid uh, in the government to the, the lessons that can be learnt uh, from, from past experience. Now, I'm not saying this is easy, but one must at least try. And I think the counsel of despair I remember being given at Oxford as an undergraduate, oh, you can't learn lessons from history, that's journalism, dear boy. That counsel of despair has actually led to a kind of uh, fatalism uh, and, and a neglect of, of the things that can be learned. I, I'll give a concrete example. I think that one of the big mistakes that was made by the public health bureaucracies in most Western countries was not to pay much attention to what had happened in the cases of SARS and MERS, which were both coronavirus uh, outbreaks. They didn't become uh, global because uh, the, the, the virus was so lethal that it couldn't really spread very far. Uh, but that, that was something that the Taiwanese and the South Koreans studied pretty closely, and, and we didn't. Uh, so th th there's a clear e example there. Um, if I look back to work that I did uh, in the ascent of money on, on financial crises, it was staggering to me how few people when the financial crisis began in 2008, had any real understanding uh, of the financial crisis, the biggest previous financial crisis of, of 1929 to 32. So learning from history doesn't give you a kind of cookbook recipe, this is what you do in case of a pandemic. But I think if one's aware of past disasters, uh, one has a sense of at least some of the pitfalls that policymakers can fall into. Larry Brilliant gave a wonderful TED talk. He's a, an epidemiologist based here in the US back in, I think, 2005, where he said the key to pandemics, and he'd worked on the eradication of, of smallpox, the key, he said, is early detection and early action. That, that's the real lesson of, of, of the modern pandemic. And, and, and that lesson was, was completely lost, as far as I can see, on, on the public health bureaucracies in the US and the UK, uh, who kind of dithered around in January, February, and uh, in the case of the US, made no successful effort to increase testing. Actually, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, made it harder to get a test, not, not easier. Well, actually, that reminds me of something else that I think is relevant to that, which is you pointed out that maybe having looked at the public health systems of Taiwan or South Korea or other places in East Asia might have given a very important um, object lesson. Of course, the fact that most of what was going on there wasn't going on, on in English was perhaps relevant. Remember, I recently actually talked to Malcolm Gladwell, who's published a book actually about the history of, of, of bombing and the, the ethical lessons from that in the Second World War. But one of the almost sort of observations he made in passing was that certain scientific discoveries relevant to World War II bombing by the Americans were not noticed by them because they'd only be published in Japanese, or actually not even Japanese, by Japanese scholars in Esperanto, which I'm sure you know was, oddly enough, quite common in early 20th century Japan for reasons we, we won't go into uh, to, to here. But the point remained that there's an awful lot of information and knowledge out there but not all of it is easily accessible from the point of view of, say, Anglophones in North America. And that's a very good example for globalising history and applying global history as well. It, it is, although it must be said that if one looks into the major scientific disciplines that are relevant to a problem like uh, a, a pandemic, to a far greater extent than was true even 20 years ago, and certainly to a far greater extent than in the 1930s and 1940s, they are in English. I mean, the literature that was coming out of Wuhan uh, in the very early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was, was in English because uh, Chinese scientists have, have long been accustomed to publish their, their preprints uh, in English. So, so I, I can't offer that excuse to the people in, in key positions uh, at the beginning of 2020, who, who I think flunked this uh, quite badly. But you're right to raise the question of how do we learn from history, because that's certainly the motivation behind writing this book. 
I wanted to write a book that, that dealt with disaster as a general category, a phenomenon that can come in, in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Because we have, I think, developed a tendency to focus excessively narrowly on just one or two scenarios that we find appealing. So we're very fascinated as a species right now, or at least the elites of, uh, uh, of humanity are, with the prospect of disastrous man-made climate change. And uh, enormous amounts of, uh, of hot air are emitted by people talking about this problem. Uh, but it's only one of a, a wide range of disasters that can conceivably befall us. And it might not necessarily be the, the most uh, clear and present danger, because as we saw last year, novel pathogen can move a lot more rapidly than, than climate change. And there are other things which we aren't paying much attention to, uh, which, which could be just as catastrophic and, again, faster acting. And I'll, I'll throw out one example of, of the kind of disaster we don't think about nearly enough. Uh, if we had the kind of volcanic activity that the world had from the late 1100s to the late 1200s, or even right through until about 1815, which was the last huge eruption, uh, Mount Tambora, then we very quickly would be having a conversation about global cooling. Uh, so enormous the, of, of the, of the effect would be. It's just that recently, and I'm talking about for the last couple of hundred years, there haven't been really big volcanic eruptions. And so we've kind of forgotten that they can happen. Uh, and, you know, one could make a similar argument about changes in sunspot activity. So I conclude the book by trying to offer a much larger menu of potential disasters that we should think about, because I fear that we might expend a great deal of effort on one disaster and end up being given a completely different one to deal with. So one of the ways in which you use this wider category of catastrophe is to look at some longer range historical phenomena. And I want to pick up on one that we've mentioned a couple of times before. When you said actually now that, uh, just now, that uh, uh, a lot of the first scientific research uh, coming out of Wuhan uh, in China was actually in English, I'd point out that from reliable sources, there are other areas of Chinese research, possibly in artificial intelligence, which are possibly in Chinese only and restricted to certain readers. But we will right. possibly get that, get back to the, uh, the present day uh, aspects of that in, in just a moment. China's rise is something that you've written about on various occasions. You know, you have been teaching at Tsinghua University in China in, in, in recent years, and you bring it up in this book as well in a variety of different contexts. I mean, could I ask a, a mischievous question, which is, is the rise of China in the modern world a catastrophe? Not in itself. That's to say the uh, reduction of poverty, the growth of the Chinese economy, uh, all of these things uh, are, are by themselves good. Uh, nobody wants China to be trapped in the kind of poverty that characterized it uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. The problem is the rise of China under the Chinese Communist Party is, I think, a potentially disastrous outcome. Uh, because for, for uh, whom, Neil? It's probably not a disastrous outcome for the Chinese Communist Party or the millions of people they rule over. Well, that, that remains to be seen, because what, one of the things about communist parties, if one just le learns from history, is that they have a very bad habit of inflicting disastrous mortality on their own peoples periodically. And that, that, that of course, uh, is the same Chinese Communist Party we're talking about that inflicted the biggest man-made famine of them all during the Great Leap Forward, that inflicted the Cultural Revolution on its own, on its own people in the late 1960s, and 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 so one has to remember that if a if a totalitarian regime has a good run uh, in raising uh, living standards, which this one certainly has, that that doesn't protect its people uh, from that party uh, committing future disastrous mistakes, because the, the party is entirely unaccountable. It is functionally above the law, uh, and it has no. Uh, opposition, it cannot be criticised. And as you know, uh, Rana, since Xi Jinping came to power, the clock has been turned back in many ways in, in China, not, not least in the universities, where the relative freedom I first encountered when I started travelling to China has really gone. And uh, there, there's a great deal uh, more of that old chill in the air that I remember uh, from my visits to, to the Soviet Union. That th Things have become a great deal more ideological, more explicitly anti-Western. Uh, this is a regime that is essentially telling schools no more books that extol the virtues of foreign systems. Uh, from now on, you'll study Xi Jinping's speeches. Uh, and I think we, we are a little bit reluctant in the West to recognize just how much 
China has changed and for the worse uh, under Xi Jinping. Uh, so in answer to your question, uh, the rise of the CCP-led China poses a potential threat to China's uh, own population. Uh, I, I don't rule that out. Uh, but it also poses a threat to everybody else, because as China expands uh, its reach technologically and economically, it's able to exert pressure on the free societies of the world uh, in all kinds of ways that uh, are perhaps more obvious right now in Australia than they are in the UK, but I think are relevant uh, to everybody. Uh, one of the big takeaways of the book is that totalitarianism is a very bad thing. It caused some of the highest levels of excess mortality in the 20th century, whether it was uh, Stalin's version uh, Mao's version, or for that matter, Hitler's. And we shouldn't be happy to see the growing power of a one-party state, even if it says, oh, we won't do that kind of thing again. Because what happened, let's remember what happened in, in December of 2019, January of 2020, it was like a vast Chernobyl in the sense that a disaster occurred and the immediate response of the CCP at the local and the national level was to cover it up. Uh, and to deny that this problem was real, to tell the World Health Organization, no, there's no human to human transmission. And only when it was too late, uh, when the genie was out the bottle and the virus was everywhere, did they finally acknowledge what had gone wrong. That's not a great advertisement for this system, I think. No, fair enough. And I don't think anyone, certainly not me, is advertising the, uh, uh, putting forward positive advertising for the system. But I want to just push back a little bit against one of the analyses in your book, again, drawing, if I may, on, on your own work. And while we're doing that, again, just a reminder to everyone, I see some questions coming in and we're going to turn to Q&A in just a moment or two. But please do keep more of them coming in and please do make sure that you are tweeting away on hashtag IQ2. Um, so let's talk briefly about the historical uh, context of the Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, you point out and others here may well know, is this sort of very large projected idea which brings together economics and geopolitics, the idea that China is going to be sponsoring through you know, huge amounts of, of debt for other countries, essentially uh, the building of, of bridges, but also uh, you know, uh, power stations, but also, of course, the new tech infrastructure, which is going to underpin 5G, the Internet of Things, and the uh, new cyber enabled world that we're, uh, we're, we're moving into. And you characterize this in terms of empire, something which you've written about, you know, more than once previously. And obviously, um, it's, it's a model that's, that's very um, persuasive in terms of thinking about what China's doing. But let me give you perhaps a less apocalyptic vision of how, over time, comparing what China's doing now might make us a little bit less nervous than we might be in the Western world. But first of all, this type of empire that China's putting forward doesn't seem really like a kind of classic empire on the grounds that actually it's lots of different private enterprises sort of bumping up against each other, sometimes succeeding, sometimes failing. You know, even the debt traps which people talk about are often happening because actually the Chinese thought they were onto a good investment, which turns out in the end, surprise, surprise, to be a rather, rather bad one. The amount of lending that China has done under that initiative actually really plummeted in the last year or two as they found themselves really not in a position to spread too much largesse at all. And they've largely moved towards actually sending out vaccines and putting forward a... Um, a kind of uh, uh, intentions about potentially enabling people's cyber capacity in future years. In other words, if this is an attempt to build a global empire, it's actually a pretty ropey one, isn't it? Well, empires are always a bit ropey when you study them up close. And uh, the description you, you've just given of Chinese expansion reminds me vividly of the early stages of, of, of British expansion, that sort of strange combination of, uh, of competing private agencies and then the bad debt problem that, that you weren't quite expecting. But I don't think the Belt and Road Initiative, or One Belt, One Road, as it's sometimes called, is really the, the, the biggest worry that China poses. Uh, our, our friend and uh, uh, a student, Ike Fryman, has written a terrific book on this, which shows that really this is as much propaganda as it is a, a grand design for world domination. But I, when I look at other aspects of, of China's expansion and, uh, and also the tone of the, the new wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, I, I find myself a great deal less uh, easy in my mind. First of all, China has a capacity, thanks to its 
uh, development of artificial intelligence and the expansion of its payment platforms to extend its model of surveillance beyond its, its borders. And the fact that the smart city technology based on facial recognition is now being available, is being made available in, in dozens of countries around the world, should I think give us pause. In fact, I, I think that is a more serious uh, risk than uh, one belt, one road infrastructure projects uh, financed in ways that turn out to have been somewhat Im Im imprudent. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think when one's thinking about future challenges and future dangers, the way I put it is this, that China is certainly expanding in empire-like ways. Uh, it is also clearly a much more serious competitor technologically than the Soviet Union was, particularly when it comes to information technology. And the vision of a surveillance state, which Orwell had in 1984, is far closer to being realized in Xi Jinping's China than it ever was uh, under Mao or Stalin, because the technology really does allow the party, if it wishes, to monitor citizens' uh, everyday lives, everyday transactions. Now, that in itself uh, is not a reason to expect uh, the end of the world. We're not doomed because of the rise of China, but we will be in a very difficult position if the superpower rivalry that we currently see, which I think merits the name Cold War II, escalates into hot war. And that's really the, the scenario which I, I worry about a lot because it seems to me that a lot of the ingredients are now in place for a superpower conflict in Asia uh, that will come as, as, as much of a surprise as, as the Korean War did in 1950. So I, I end the book by offering reflections on the way in which things could blow up over Taiwan uh, in, in a relatively near time frame. And after all, wars historically are second only to pandemics when it comes to causing really large amounts of premature death. So that's something I think we should worry about a lot more. And of course, it's worth remembering that China did fight a war previously about Taiwan, but it was in 1895 with Japan. On that occasion, the Japanese won in slightly different circumstances. Um, I, see that, I see we've got a whole variety of questions coming in uh, based on your um, ideas, Neil. So I will start putting those to you. This one relates to where you're sitting right now. And as I say, we're crossing our fingers that the catastrophic earthquake that you talked about doesn't uh, hit anytime soon. But the question comes to you, Neil. You mentioned this will inevitably happen at some point on the West Coast. And yet there's no ma mass flight from California. Is that not, our question asks, a sign of remarkable resilience and bargaining, an indication that we do all know that catastrophe is part of life, and essentially, it's part of life that we're actually OK with. Yeah, that's a great question. And in a way, that's that's one of the themes of the book, that we, we have to live with this thought of impending doom. And I give the example of the British soldiers on the Western Front in the First World War singing, the bells of hell go ting-a-ling-a-ling for you, but not for me. Uh, a song which, when I first heard it, struck me as as fascinating because it gives you an insight into the way that, that, that young men think about the very real danger that they all faced. I mean, basically, people underestimate the risk that it will happen to them. And one saw that again, actually, during the, the pandemic. We have to think in that way, I think, in order not to be crippled by anxiety. Uh, and if, you, if you're living in close proximity to a fault line, you can't really uh, jump at every... Uh, every tremor, because you will very quickly find your life is miserable. It's a little bit like during the Cold War. We, we knew that there was a risk of thermonuclear war, but we didn't live our lives with that thought prominently in our minds. Uh, and, I, and I think that's part of the coping strategy of, of being human. On the other hand, uh, when you look at the probabilities uh, of geological disaster uh, in parts of Asia, Indonesia, for example, and Japan, uh, I think it's different. And I think one can see, if one considers the Japanese uh, history, uh, a much more intense preoccupation with what you'll do in case of, of an earthquake or a tsunami than we have here. We've only just this week rolled out a proper California-wide alert system only this week that would actually let people get on their phones an earthquake warning. Uh, and that tells you that we're not really as focused on this uh, uh, as, we, as we ought to be. Uh, earthquakes 
Um, uh, for some reason, and this is uh, one of the mysteries of humanity, uh, fault lines seem to attract us. We love to build our cities on them. A, a map of the world with fault lines and conurbations would make you think that human beings enjoyed earthquakes and were drawn towards tsunamis. So I think this is one of the puzzles. My sense, now I've lived here for four years, is that we're all a little bit in denial about this. Uh, and nobody truly has uh, a coherent uh, game plan for the big one. And we can see that when the wildfires became much, much worse last year. Uh, I, I did not see a society that had a realistic risk assessment of the danger of wildfire. On the contrary, the Californians have been in denial about this problem for, for the last 20 years. And I'm afraid it's only going to be getting worse because nobody has a solution. Well, I wonder if that leads us rather nicely into the question that's just come in from Christopher. Uh, and he asks, he says, hello, Neil, what do you see as the three greatest dangers in the modern world apart from climate change? So he's rather specific on that. I'm always just sort of taking notes for the State Department or something. And do you think that too much effort is being directed towards climate action of those, those dangers? What's your thoughts about that? Well, that's a great question, Christopher. I do think that we are focusing too much resources and attention on the climate uh, change risk. That's not because I'm a denier. I think there are very obvious dangers and that the probability of the worst case scenario uh, that the International Panel of Climate Change uh, envisaged has gone up, not down. By the way, one reason the risk is going up is that for all their fine words, the Chinese continue to build coal burning power stations at a terrific clip. Uh, did you know that 48% of the increase in CO2 emissions in the last, well, since Paris are due to, to, uh, to China and China alone? So I, I think this is a problem, but it's not the only problem. And it's a relatively slow acting problem, as uh, Bjorn Lomberg argued in his, his most recent book, compared with some of the other things that could conceivably go wrong. Now, I've already mentioned that a US-China war would be a whole different ballgame from war in Iraq uh, or war in Afghanistan. We've forgotten what great power conflict can look like. And if you want a sense of what it might look like, Jim Stavridis uh, uh, has recently published a, a novel based on his uh, extensive knowledge as, uh, as a former admiral uh, in the US Navy, uh, 2034. Uh, so that, that would be my number one risk. Let's not forget what a really big war could do. Uh, number two, which is kind of a subset of this, would be full-blown uh, cyber warfare causing an outage of the internet. We are now heavily, heavily reliant on this technology that we're using right now for this conversation. Full-blown outage would plunge our systems into chaos, uh, even if, if there was no other war going on. Uh, and cyber warfare is already underway on a very, very, fairly low level. It's a sort of permanent state, almost Hobbesian state uh, of conflict. But if it were to escalate in such a way that critical infrastructure were disrupted, I don't like to think how U.S. society would cope with that. Uh, I'm very doubtful that we would prove uh, resilient in the face of that kind of catastrophe. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw in just for fun the super volcano scenario because nobody thinks about that. But actually spending a year in Montana, which I did to get away from uh, not only the pandemic, but the crazy regulations they introduced in California was a good reminder because the Yellowstone super volcano was one of the most cataclysmic uh, events of the distant past. Something like that would completely transform our sense of, uh, of the climate risk. And I, I do think that the, we talk about man-made climate change as if it's the only sort that really matters. But historically, uh, we've seen periods of, uh, of, of, of abnormal cold in the wake of massive volcanic eruptions. We've forgotten that that can happen. I can't think of a single reason why that couldn't happen in the relatively near future. We've just had a quiet 200 years. But would the point be, Neil, not that it's the only type of climate change that could happen, but it's the only type, man-made or human-made, is the only type that we can actually do anything very much about? Yeah, but I, but I think that if, if you're asking me what are the things that we should be thinking about other than man-made climate change, the, the list is, is quite a, a, a long one. And I, I think that's part of the point of doom, uh, to point out that if you're very, very well prepared for one particular form of disaster, you shouldn't be surprised if history slaps you in the face with a completely different disaster. You almost never get the disaster you're well prepared for. That's that's the lesson, I think, of, of a succession of presidencies that I, I, I review towards the end of the book, uh, because I think that that's the, the, the inherent problem of the way that we think about 
problems, we tend to focus on the last one. I noticed last year that many, many policymakers uh, responded to the aftermath of the, uh, the onset of the pandemic as if it was a financial crisis and used the same tools that had been deployed after 2008. Uh, and that was a kind of category error in many ways, because clearly a pandemic's not a financial crisis. But it's very, very tempting, both in military and civilian affairs, to want to fight the last war or to fight the war that you've spent a lot of time preparing for. Uh, and history is just not kind that way. In fact, history seems to quite like playing the trick on us of giving us a disaster that we really didn't think that much about until it happened. Well, that actually, um, I think, leads into well, a couple of questions, which I'm going to bring together because they're on, on a similar topic, but they get to an aspect of what you've just said, Neil, which is the way in which you know governing parties, governments can use catastrophe as a means of forwarding their own nationalistic aims. Uh, I mean, you know, we've talked about China before. It's also, I think, fair to say that plenty of countries around the world are using their COVID response as a way of defining themselves. Until recently, India was portraying itself as someone that had done very well, and this had reflected better on the society. Now, of course, it's put itself into, into reverse mode on that. Do you think that we're going to see an era of political opportunism, which essentially draws on capac the capacity to deal with catastrophe as a way of defining the polity? Well, maybe. I think politicians showed themselves by and large to be rather inept in, in if, if they tried to instrumentalise uh, the crisis last year. It usually blew up in their faces. So those who wanted to cast themselves as, as wartime leaders very quickly turned out to be doing about the worst. Uh, you would have thought uh, that a pandemic that originated in China and strongly argued for border controls would have helped Donald Trump. I mean, in a way, it played to his populist agenda, uh, but he completely screwed up uh, his handling of it. And by putting himself front and centre uh, of the uh, US government response and then, and then bungling it. So I think the attempt to instrumentalise the, the crisis has, has generally led to to failure. But what I think is true is that lower down the chain of command, for those people whose, whose lives really revolve around devising regulations and then imposing them on people, it's been a terrific opportunity. Now, I think there is a, a, a really important theme in the book that we haven't touched on, which is that the point of failure is often in middle management rather than at the top. That it's actually the bureaucracy rather than the commander in chief that can bungle things. I think it's also true that the bureaucracy in many countries has seized the opportunity presented by by the pandemic to extend its power in all kinds of different ways. And one sees this in almost trivial forms. In California, which has a, a one-party system of its own because uh, the Democrats have been dominant for so long, uh, the kind of mentality that I was struck by was the one that introduces regulations even when there's no scientific basis for them at all. There was a moment when they closed the, the parks and beaches here last year uh, which I found completely bizarre since there was a, a single reason to think that COVID spread outdoors. Almost all the research coming out of the early phase of the pandemic showed that it was spread indoors. Uh, and, and therefore, to close the parks and beaches just seemed potty. But there they were. Officials were going to Californian beaches. There was one, one man who was stopped from paddle boarding in the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, because of, uh, of COVID. So I think the real winners here have been the, the petty regulators who've had a field day. It reminds me a little bit of the you know, the air raid wardens uh, who were satirized in BBC's Dad's Army. You can remember the insufferable man who was constantly telling people uh, to, to pull their curtains. I, I, those people have had a terrific opportunity to exercise power, and they're still doing it, even when it's clear that most of the regulations that remain, remain here are kind of superfluous. Well, the Dad's Army phrase, of course, is don't you know there's a war on? So you say, don't, there, <laughs> don't you know there's a, there's a pandemic on? I mean, Absolutely. Just, just to take that point for a moment about middle management, I mean, you, you've expressed in terms of where we are now with the pandemic. Do you think that that operates historically as well? Looking at the past disasters over the last you know, 200 years or so as modern governments develop, is there always that sort of bureaucratic layer that essentially messes up what's happening from, from the top? Or is it something peculiar to this current crisis to do with disease, science and so forth? I think if you compare us with the 1950s, uh, hmm. we, we have become more bureaucratic. And uh, the, the, the striking thing to me when I look at 
the, uh, the, the pandemics of the 1950s is the nimbleness of the, the government's response. Uh, the CDC in the US was of relatively recent origin in 1957. There wasn't an enormous sprawling Department of Health and Human Services as there is today. And yet when you look at what the uh, advice was that the public health officials gave Eisenhower, it was, it was remarkably uh, a pragmatic and, and clear-headed. Uh, and my sense is that in the US at least, and it may be true of the UK, I'm, I'm sure if Dominic Cummings uh, were here, he, he'd say it, is that there has been a decline in the competence of, of government. Uh, and that's a, a view that Francis Fukuyama has, uh, has put forward too. So I'm not alone in making this case. Uh, Mark Andreessen talked about it uh, during the pandemic. There's a, a hideous word, kludgeocracy, that somebody coined to capture the ways in which uh, the so-called administrative state deals with uh, the, the risk of disaster and then bungles the disaster when it happens. I'll, I'll throw out one anecdote just to illustrate the point. Uh, th there was and indeed is uh, a, an undersecretary or is it a deputy secretary for pandemic preparedness in the Department of Health and Human Services. It's his one job. Uh, and one of the mysteries to me of last year was where he was because he was almost completely missing in action. And I delved into uh, the, uh, the role of, of Robert uh, Kadlec and, and found a wonderful lecture that he'd given in 2018 in Texas uh, in which he reflected that if, uh, if we really didn't prepare a bit better for a pandemic, we'd be SOL. I didn't know what SOL stood for. Uh, it's a U.S. military speak for shit out of luck. Uh, and this was the guy whose one job it was to prepare for a pandemic. And there are 36 page long pandemic preparedness plans. U ultimately, there are, there's almost a countless amount no. of, of paperwork on this. It's just that none of it worked. And that's I mean, the thing that interests me. Clearly not the bureaucracy's private uh, uh, fi finest hour, but just to go back to the 1950s for a second. Between then and now, one could perhaps argue the other way that over the last 60 years or so, that same health and human services behemoth has also been responsible for one of the biggest changes that's improved people's standard of life, which is stopping people smoking. It's something done through regulation. It's done off the back of research, which is mostly paid for by the state, by people like the Brits or Richard Dole on the grounds that private enterprise didn't want to pay for things that would reduce profits. So uh, smoking and people dying in their millions from smoking was also a catastrophe over years. Isn't that perhaps the example of how the bureaucracy can also get it right? Oh, I think that's clear. And one of the striking stories that I, I tell in the book is, is all the kind of imperceptible, not necessarily much celebrated improvements in public health uh, that, that long predated the campaign against uh, tobacco, going all the way back to the, the improvements in, in basic hygiene in, in British cities that can be traced from the Victorian period. Uh, it, it was actually improvements in, in basic hygiene that, that did a lot of the reduction of, uh, of mortality uh, and the extension of life expectancy, more really than the great scientific medical breakthroughs that we tend to, to make much more of. So I don't disagree with that. My point is, is generally, uh, not specifically about uh, public health, but generally about, about bureaucracy. What I think has evolved, and it's really from let's say the 1970s, is a somewhat legalistic state of mind in which if there is some probability uh, greater than zero of a particular uh, negative adverse outcome, you need to have at least a 36-page document spelling out a whole series uh, of measures to be taken preemptively or in response. Great detailed regulation that doesn't work when the crisis happens. Think of all those pages of regulation of bank capital uh, back in the 2000s, the Basel uh, rules on bank capital adequacy, which proved utterly useless uh, when the financial crisis struck in 2008. So I don't think this is a peculiar problem of public health. Actually, public health has achieved a great many victories uh, over the last century. But more recently, I think we've seen a major failure of public health bureaucracies. And I think it's because the legalistic bureaucratic mindset has come into that world from other domains. For the media, it's much easier to say it was all the fault of Boris. It was all the fault of Trump. That, that's been a recurrent narrative over the past year. But I think that gets us away from the real problem, which is a rather more profound one and, and actually rather harder to fix. I mean, you can replace a president. We did. Uh, but you can't overnight transform the culture uh, of a bureaucracy like CDC, which very clearly failed for reasons that had nothing to do with Trump. 
I'm going to squeeze in a couple more questions here, which are almost sort of opposite sides of the same questions. I'll put them both to you, uh, Neil. One of our questions is asked, without the internet, could we have had lockdown in 2020? Well, I guess we could have had lockdown, but it wouldn't have been quite the same sort of lockdown. And the other question is, what role does 24-hour news have on the way that people react and therefore politicians respond? Is this why, compared to the 1950s, it was unpoliticized then and politicized now? And that relates, of course, to your wider questions about networks and information so what, what's two great thought? questions i know we're running short of time so i'll have to give a brief answers yeah it made a huge difference we couldn't have done the lockdowns in the 1950s even if uh, the asian flu had been far worse because hardly anybody could work from home in those days whereas uh, if you look at uh, Nick Bloom's work, terrific uh, British economist at Stanford, about a third of all jobs in the US can be done just as well, 100% as well at home as in the office. And that's because of the internet. And, and therefore, I think lockdowns were possible in 2020 in a way they never really had been before. And that's important because it, their possibility tempted us to do them without really doing that good a cost-benefit analysis of the downsides uh, of of what we were doing. On the second question, I don't think it's just that it's 24-7. The problem is the way in which news has been polarized, uh, and in particular, the ways in which news has shifted uh, onto the internet and become a domain uh, for clickbait. Uh, remember that the primary objective of the network platforms is to get your attention and retain it for long enough uh, that you see ads. The thing that does that is sensational stories that don't necessarily have to be true. Uh, and what, what I wrote about in the Square and the Tower book that you and I discussed, Ron, a couple of years ago, has turned out to be pretty prescient. But if you leave that uh, status quo, if you allow news to become part of this highly polarized public sphere in which the primary motivation of the platforms is to sell ads and engage eyeballs, you're going to get a lot of crazy stuff, uh, crazy stuff about about the virus, crazy stuff about rem remedies and crazy stuff about vaccines. That's done tremendous harm. So it's not the amount of news. I think it's the way in which the news has become polarised and polluted with fake news. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Neil. We're beginning to get to time, so I'll throw one last one in for you for a brief answer. And I'll combine it actually with a, with a, with a, with a thought that I had about the book as well. The question comes in uh, saying, thank you for a fascinating and terrifying expose. So what grounds do we have for any optimism or is it a truly bleak outlook for us all? And I would point out as I throw that back to you for a last thought, Neil, that in your book, you do say, at least you think that the likelihood of an alien invasion from space is a relatively small likelihood. So is that the best you can offer us in terms of bleakness, or is there no, anything I, else? I want to be clear that, that Doom is a slightly ironical title, uh, inspired by, you'll remember, Private Fraser, we're doomed. Uh, in fact, we're not doomed. The probability of, of complete extinction is, is, is a lot lower than you'd think from reading science fiction, just as the probability of an alien invasion is really low because the distances seem overwhelmingly large and the probability of there being aggressive, intelligent life doesn't seem to me to be that high, at least not within striking distance of Earth. So it's actually an optimistic book. I found it cheering to write this book because it reminded me that this really wasn't by any means the worst disaster that mankind has confronted. And it certainly wasn't likely to be an extinction level event. I mean, 0.04% of the world's population is a terrible tragedy when you express it as 3 million lives. But in the great scheme of human history, uh, it is not really anything close to a, an extinction level event. Uh, we survive. We survive. And the majority of us survive. The majority of people on the Western Front in World War I survived. It was only a minority of those uh, Tommies for whom the bells of hell really did go ding a ling a ling. And so it's actually contrary to what you might expect from the title. It's, it's a cheering book that reminds you that at the end of it all, most of us are fine. And life goes on. And, and as you pointed out, Rana, we quite often forget the disasters. I wouldn't be at all surprised if 100 years from now, this wasn't uh, a major topic in the history books, uh, in the same way that the 57-58 pandemic has entirely vanished without trace. I can just expect it will be filmed soon, Neil, under the title It's a Wonderful Life 2, judging by the way that you characterised <laughs> it there. Regardless of what you think of the title, it is a fascinating read. I'd like to thank Neil Ferguson very much for being with us here. I'd like to thank all of you from around the world, the audience who have come to us for this event. And I'd like to thank Intelligence Squared for organising yet another fantastic event.